Chapter 5 After the glimpse I had had of the Martians emerging from the cylinder, a kind of fascination paralysed my actions. I was a battleground of fear and curiosity. I did not dare to go back towards the pit, but I felt a passionate longing to peer into it. I began walking in a big curve, seeking some point of vantage and continually looking at the sand heaps. Most of the spectators had gathered in one of two groups, one a little crowd towards working, the other a knot of people in the direction of Chobham. I approached one man. He was a neighbour of mine, though I did not know his name. What ugly brutes, he said. Good God, what ugly brutes. He repeated this over and over again. Did you see a man in the pit, I said, but he made no answer to that. The sunset faded to twilight before anything further happened. The crowd, far away on the left, towards Woking, seemed to grow. I heard now a faint murmur from it. There was scarcely any movement from the pit. As the dusk came on, a slow, intermittent movement towards the sand pits began. Vertical black figures in twos and threes would advance, stop, watch and advance again, spreading out as they did so in a thin, irregular crescent. I, too, on my side, began to move towards the pit. Then I saw some cabmen and others had walked boldly into the sand pits. I heard the sound of hooves and wheels, and then, within thirty yards of the pit, advancing from the direction of Horshaw, I noted a little black knot of men. They were led by a man waving a white flag. Flutter, flutter, went the flag, first to the right, then to the left. It was too far for me to recognise anyone there. But afterwards, I learned that Ogilvy, Stent and Henderson were with others in this attempt to communicate with the Martians. A number of dim black figures followed at discreet distances. Suddenly, there was a flash of light, luminous, greenish smoke came out of the pit in three distinct puffs, one after the other, straight into the still air. This smoke, or flame perhaps would be the better word for it, was so bright that the deep blue sky overhead seemed to darken abruptly. At the same time, a faint hissing sound became audible. Beyond the pit stood the little wedge of people with the white flag, small vertical black shapes upon the black ground. As the green smoke arose, their faces flashed out, pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming into a long, loud, droning noise. Slowly, a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out from it. Flashes of flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly turned to fire. Then, by the light of their own destruction, I saw them staggering and falling, and their supporters turning to run. I stood staring, not as yet realising that this was death 
leaping from man to man in that little, distant crowd. All I felt was that it was something very strange, an almost noiseless and blinding flash of light, and a man fell headlong and lay still. As the unseen shaft of heat passed over them, pine trees burst into fire. Every dry furze bush became a mass of flames. Far away towards Knapp Hill, I saw the flashes of trees and hedges and wooden buildings suddenly set alight. It was sweeping round swiftly and steadily, this flaming death this invisible, inevitable sword of heat. I perceived it coming towards me by the flashing bushes it touched and was too astonished and stupefied to stir. I heard the crackle of fire in the sand pits and the sudden squeal of a horse. All along a curving line beyond the sand pits, the dark ground smoked and crackled Something fell with a crash far away to the left where the road from Woking Station opens out onto the common. Then the hissing and the humming ceased and the black shape sank slowly out of sight into the pit. All this had happened with such swiftness that I stood motionless, dumbfounded and dazzled by the flashes of light. Death had passed and spared me, but left the night about me suddenly dark and unfamiliar. The common was dark almost to blackness, except where its roadways lay grey and pale under the deep blue sky of the early night. It was suddenly void of men. Overhead there were stars and in the west the sky was still a pale bright, almost greenish blue. The tops of the pine trees and the roofs of Horshaw came out sharp and black against the western afterglow. The Martians were now invisible, save for that thin mast upon which their restless mirror wobbled. Patches of bush and isolated trees here and there still smoked and glowed. I looked down in terrible astonishment. The little group of black specks with the flag of white had been swept out of existence. Yet the stillness of the evening had scarcely been broken. It came to me that I was upon this dark common, helpless, unprotected and alone. Suddenly, came fear. With an effort I turned and began a stumbling run through the heather. The fear I felt was no rational fear but a panic terror, not only of the Martians but of the dusk and stillness all about me. I ran weeping silently. Once I had turned I did not dare to look back. I remember an extraordinary feeling of being played with. This mysterious death could leap from the pit around the cylinder at any moment and strike me down. Chapter 6 Chapter 6 gives more information about the events described in the previous chapter. They saw the flashes and the men falling, and an invisible hand, as it were, lit the bushes as it hurried towards them through the twilight. Then, with a whistling note that rose above the droning of the pit, the beam swung close over their heads, lighting the tops of the beech trees that lined the road, and splitting the bricks, smashing the windows, firing the window frames. In the sudden thud, hiss and glare of the igniting trees, the panic-stricken crowd seemed to have swayed hesitatingly for some moments.
Sparks and burning twigs began to fall into the road. Hats and dresses caught fire. Then came a crying from the common. There were shrieks and shouts, and suddenly a mounted policeman came galloping through the confusion with his hands clasped over his head, screaming. They're coming, a woman shrieked. Everyone was turning and pushing at those behind. Where the road grows narrow, the crowd jammed and a desperate struggle occurred. All that crowd did not escape. Two women and a little boy were crushed and trampled there and left to die amid the terror and the darkness.